I absolutely do not believe that social media is going to solve our problems. In fact, I think it's exacerbated some of our most complicated issues in the news industry and in the entertainment media industry and in broadcasting. Um, and so please hear me when I say social media is a problem, but I think if we're really specific about how we use it, um, it can be a tool to engage audiences and grow communities. Um, so with that being said, just one quick thought about what I like to call PAM, which is purpose, audience, and message. I always want to keep this in mind whenever we're talking about strategies when it comes to digital, because it's really going to depend on your station. And I think you all know this inherently, right? Who you're serving, your audience, what your point is or your role is in your community, and what you're trying to get people to connect with, what they, um, what they think about when they think about your station. Um, are all going to be slightly different, which means you're actually going to make slightly different choices because of that PAM. And I'm a huge proponent when I work with stations, when I do consulting, when I send my students out to work with stations, and we're trying to do strategy and think about how to do things better or differently, is that there's never a one-size-fits-all model. In fact, I just advocate typically doing, um, doing less, but doing it at a higher quality, um, but making those decisions based on who you are and your position in the community, what you can achieve based on your personnel, your resources, right? Um, and not just trying to do it all. I think we've definitely had that time in, in the in, in news industry in general um, and in, in uh, broadcasting in general where we've tried to do it all, and that's just exhausting. <laughs> so you're here to talk about social media platforms. Here's um, the prevailing wisdom when it comes to what we can do with these in order to make them work for your station. So I like to go back to the original purpose of social media. Um, if you remember MySpace and Facebook back at the very beginning, uh, they were just meant to connect people. So their original purpose was to help you have um, fairly surface level relationships uh, with people that you graduated high school with or that, you know, you your aunt in Kentucky so that you could right, um, kind of stay in contact and share uh, what was going on. Um, what's interesting is when the news industry jumped into um, and the entertainment industry jumped into um, social media proper, we uh, used it as a content delivery tool, but it never really was that. And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing kind of a weird misfit. Um, with what we do as stations on social media and what actually engages on social media is because the original purpose was just social connection. Um, it wasn't to give people information about their lives or their communities. Um, people used something else for that. Um, so just to kind of situate us there, we know social media is where our audiences spend most of their time, but here's the big thing that we all know is it completely out of our control. In fact, the algorithms are becoming even more murky than they have been in the past, and they're de-emphasizing news and information uh, on most, especially meta-driven platforms like Facebook and Instagram. So what we need to lean into, in my estimation, is this idea of shared experience or connection. That's what social was built for, and that is what the algorithms are going to preference, not necessarily information delivery. Um, and so I want to talk about kind of the ways that that happens. Back up just a bit. I got to use some data because it's fun. And if you haven't seen these in a while, this is the newest Pew Center research from 2023. It just came out a little bit ago. This tells us where the audience is. So we know that the vast majority of Americans, of Georgians, are using social media for hours every day. They're using different platforms, but we know they're on their phones a lot. Um, and that they're using these tools and they're consuming things on these tools. It always is really important to point out that YouTube is the king. It absolutely is. It's got the lion's share of our audience and it continues to grow. About 83% of US adults say they use YouTube. Um, that's huge. Now, a lot of times they use it just to watch a video and pop off, right? They're not interacting with it like a social media, um, but it really is the king. Facebook is a close second, followed by Instagram. I always love that Pinterest is like ranking so high still, right? That's such like a niche thing, but the Pinterest uh, people are serious. Um, then followed by TikTok, which obviously we've seen a lot of growth in our younger audiences, LinkedIn, and then further down Snapchat, Twitter, or X. Um, and I wouldn't really worry about Be Real at that point. That one's kind of fallen off the map for the most part. 
So it's good to kind of go, hey, this is where people are on these platforms. The second thing I want to show you is what the age demographic breakdown works on these platforms. And so green is uh, people over 65, the darker green. And then darker blue on the right are 18 to 29 year olds. And I think there's just a couple quick things to pull off of this. Number one, if we look down at Facebook, we notice that the demographic's really small um, and tight. Now, what's interesting about Facebook is that it's not actually just those people on the platform. In fact, people in their teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s are on Facebook, but they never post. Or if they do, it's like once a year. They're more like Facebook lurkers. The people who post the most are, most are in that 50 to 60 demographic, and they're kind of, it's their space now when it comes to the conversation. Um, that is completely different than, say, YouTube, which actually um, you know, has a, a different demographic and then Instagram, which has the widest demographic, um, which is interesting. And Snapchat's actually growing in this way as well, as well as TikTok. Um, and so I think it's just important to kind of think about numbers um, in this way. The last thing I want to show you is growth. So from 2012 to 2023, this is how these platforms have grown over time. So obviously we're seeing sharp increase in YouTube a slight decrease in Facebook. Um, Instagram has grown. And then if you can see the dark TikTok line, this has been fairly like a 45 degree angle um, in growth here. So we're seeing growth across the map, but we're also seeing um, uh, certain platforms just clearly outpace others. So one big thing I want to make sure to say, and I think this um, to me provides a lot of solace on the days when I'm running 25 social media platforms across three news organizations um, here at the University of Georgia. Um, you don't have to do it all. In fact, I would not do it all. So um, there are a lot of stations that uh, still feel, and, and um, my friends in the newspaper industry um, can get the same way. It's like, let's just throw it out there everywhere we can and hope, right, that we engage someone. Um, I would absolutely not advocate that strategy. In fact, I would go try to scale back. Uh, for instance, it's very possible that you started a Twitter account, but you just don't have the bandwidth to keep it up, particularly because Twitter is so fast moving or it doesn't work for your audience, I would say it's absolutely okay to sunset it. Create a message that says, this account is gonna go dark. We appreciate you following. Follow us here on our Instagram account, right? Um, highly recommend doing fewer things well. It has to be based on your resources and also the type of content that you can create in a quality way on a regular basis. So. TV stations should be leaning into video driven platforms. YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok um, are really the places where video thrives. Radio stations can visualize a lot of times their audio using programs such as Audiogram or Headliner. There's a lot of ways to take a piece of audio and have it auto caption, do a waveform, put an image behind it. And then those can do really well on the same types of platforms where it's kind of visually led. I think the important thing to remember is that you all do audio and video so well. And so don't feel like you have to constantly port to text or graphics if that's not really your wheelhouse, right? You're a radio station, you're a TV station. I would love to see you use the tools that you are so good at and then find the platforms, the social platforms where you can package those the best. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. One other big kind of thing to note, and this is probably one of the more important things, um, we're gonna do a session on SEO and analytics in August. And so this is gonna point that direction, but it used to be that you could post a link on Facebook or an Instagram story or somewhere on social media, and you could say, click to read the full story, right? Or click to see the video or you know whatever it is. And people would click through, not tons, but they would click. If you look at this graph, you're noticing that social referrals, which is the amount of people who move from social media to whatever you want them to click on next, have absolutely fallen off a cliff. Um, in fact, I just saw data yesterday in an email newsletter um, from the American Press Institute that showed that this is even not stark enough. People are not clicking through off social media anymore. Very rarely are they doing it. 
And so our entire strategy for a long time was built around social media, bringing people to our terrestrial station, our website, our right? And like these other things we wanted them to do. Our, our numbers are showing us that they are not referring off. They're just scrolling. They're, keep, they're staying on the product or platform, the social media platform that they're already on. So there's a couple ways to kind of deal with this. One, we know um, that we can't control social media referrals and things like that. Um, so my goal with all of my stations I work with is to create more organic digital products. So instead of trying to get people to your website or your email newsletter or whatever it is, um, look at trying to build that audience naturally. And that can be a, a session for another day, or I can absolutely jump on a call with you and kind of talk about how that may work. Um, but we're not seeing the numbers in social media referrals like we used to. So I think we need to change our strategy. And there are two things that I would encourage you to do with social media. And they're really pretty basic, but it may be like if whoever's doing your digital or if you've got somebody who's posting things online, it may just take a little bit of a, a mind frame shift. The first one is that if you go back to that original purpose of social, it's for conversation. It's for connection and, and personal back and forth, right? Um, now we all know the dangers of an open comment section and that people can obviously, you know, we have to be careful from time to time. But I would encourage every post that you make on any social media platform to not just be delivering news or information or when something is happening, but to engage people in a conversation around that thing. So the example I have up here, I don't know if you can see it, it's a little bit small. This is an article that we did about the fat of raw milk. And we did a story about how um, uh, people, this one family farm was doing raw milk and advocating for it. And we just asked, hey, where do you stand on raw milk? And the, the comments just poured in, this was on Instagram because people had feelings about raw milk, whether they were like, absolutely, I drink it every day, it's why I'm healthy, I've never been sick a day in my life, or that's disgusting, I can't believe it, like you've got to pasteurize, what are we in 19, you know, 20? It, it was fantastic. Um, and so it wasn't just that we were showing them that we were doing interesting reporting or we had a fun story or a cool idea. We did that, but then we said, tell us what you think. Some people were taking pictures of their cows. This is in Oglethorpe County, Georgia, where, you know, we've got some of that agricultural stuff going on. It was, it was fantastic. So when at all possible, post less, but build around your post the ability to have a conversation, to really have people share their thoughts and feelings and experiences and images and videos. Um, obviously you do have to monitor it a little bit, but I will say people are less ridiculous than they were say five years ago when it was all trolling all the time. Um, in general, for our news organizations and our stations, um, th they're gonna keep it mostly under control. And what you're gonna find is that they feel like they have a connection to you and to your station. Like there's, there's a conversation to be had and you are facilitating it for your community. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the best ways that we can use social media. The second way is to really build an authentic personal connection brand. So this is an Instagram as well um, from Golden Isles Broadcasting. Um, I think it's Yolanda, right? Yeah. Um, and just a picture of her in the studio talking to the mic and then asking questions, right? About what music she's playing, what she's gonna do today. Um, someone chimes in cause she is talking about um, the songs that she's gonna play and they're like, are you sure that's not my iPod? Cause if you click over here, there's a picture of her iPod screen. And then I don't know, maybe, right? There's a, there's a conversation happening with your talent, with the people that people trust in your station um, and having them, whether it's video or photos or, or whatever it is, having them engage in that conversation with the audience. That's what separates y'all from CNN or NPR. You can't have a conversation with those people, right? They're untouchable, but you all are in the community and you care about the community. And so if you can use social platforms to build that authentic connection and brand, you get your talent and the people behind the scenes to turn the cameras of their phones on themselves and show what they're doing and how they're doing it that builds so much goodwill um, for your station. So I think 
let me just break down a couple other things and then we'll start, we'll go to questions here pretty soon. Um, a couple big thoughts about the tools themselves. So um, all of this information that I'm sharing with you is actually um, part of the GAB Digital Strategy Guide. If you go to the GAB website, it's under Programs and Services, and you can actually click this link and get this guide that goes through this information, but also a little bit more in depth about all the products and platforms. So I wanted to make sure that you know this is kind of a shortened version of that. Um, your next big choice, so if I'm thinking I want to build connection and I want to build conversation on social, what platforms should I be on? Here are kind of the quick pros and cons. So obviously YouTube is um, the biggest tool and everyone can do video. So sometimes my radio station friends are like, what, video? No, absolutely. And we all have the tools in our pockets. Um, it's just a matter of thinking about, and I'll give you some examples in a minute, um, of how to do it well. We're not talking about a minute 15 A block packages, right? It doesn't have to be formal. In fact, it's better if it's not. Um, and just showing your experience, what you're doing, how you're reporting, where you're out at this event, um, you know, with the station truck, like being in the moment and capturing that. YouTube is a great place for that. And it's becoming more of a conversation uh, the more that YouTube is around, more than just a video hosting platform. Um, the nice thing about YouTube as well is it tends to target a male audience a little bit more than some social platforms. And so you can kind of grab a little bit of a younger male audience sometimes there. Uh, Facebook, obviously, it's the largest of any usual social media platform, but it is de-emphasizing news. Um, it tends to be most diverse, uh, with the exception of age. Um, and the things people like to talk about on Facebook, as most of us probably know, health, education, safety, social connection, and personalities. Facebook is nice in that it allows you to do video and photo fairly easily. Um, and then you don't have to write a lot of text. You can, um, but you don't have to in order to connect with people. Um, Instagram is a, a tool that I would probably advocate a lot of stations using if they don't already because it's linked to Facebook um, and you can actually post on both concurrently. But Instagram really is one of the, the best tools across all age groups right now. And it's the most diverse as far as the types of things you can do on it. So you can do vertical video, horizontal video, lots of photos. You can do interactive things with Instagram story. Um, and again, I can send a student to your station to help you think through all of these things as well. Um, but it really is the, one of the more popular and growing platforms, particularly for an 18 to 45 kind of age range. Um, we can't not talk about TikTok. Um, so currently at the University of Georgia, we cannot use TikTok um, because we are government funded um, and that is the, the rule in Georgia. Uh, but TikTok has its place in the ecosystem when it comes to a younger demographic. I will be honest, it's really hard to create good TikTok content, um, but if you even do it occasionally, um, there are such great opportunities for explaining, for getting people in front of the camera. Um, and, and again, I'd be happy to work with your station and kind of think about what a TikTok strategy could look like um, for you all. I also wanna just mention Snapchat real quick. Um, this has got a much younger demographic. Um, so like middle schoolers and high schoolers, um, tends to be more interpersonal. So people are sending each other snaps or little kind of private messages on Snapchat more than they're consuming larger content. Uh, but there is an opportunity to um, be on their newsfeed. Um, and so uh, that may be, if you're really trying to reach like a younger, younger demographic, that may be of use to you. I'm gonna leave Twitter last or X. Um, because it really has obviously changed in the last few years, new ownership, uh, change in um, uh, who's on it as well. We still don't know what's going on with threads, just really not sure. Um, but Twitter is definitely not the place it used to be. What we find performs best on Twitter is like high school sports, like prep sports. You can still get a really good audience on Twitter. Most other things, eh, not so much. Um, so at the news organizations I work with, we tend to only focus on the things that actually do well um, because this platform is, is a little bit unstable still. Um, it may be one that you can sunset as part of your strategy.
Okay, so a couple best practices, and then we'll see what y'all have to say. Number one, um, social listening is one of the key ideas right now, which is that you've got someone in your newsroom who gets up maybe a little bit earlier, drinks some extra coffee, and kind of goes through the social media conversations that are happening in your community. Um, you can use it for story ideas. You can use it for building connections with people. You can also use it for looking at trends and, and things that you may want to um, have your station kind of get to be part of that conversation. Um, and so highly recommend to kind of make someone a social listener um, in your organization. Um, and that leads to hopefully some of these other best practices. Um, highly recommend creating some templates or graphics that you can use on social media that can be reused. Um, we have free Canva accounts that we create for most of our stations where they just have three or four graphics they pick from and they can just reuse those. It increases your brand. Um, it's, it's really useful. Definitely think about the best days and times to post. That varies by platform, but you do want a consistent schedule. Um, so like I always like, hey, let's do local weather like a once or twice a week. Let's do some event previews once or twice a week. Let's talk about um, some of the, the music that we're gonna play or the stories we're gonna do once or twice a week. If you've got this kind of rotating quota of types of posts, then usually you don't, again, it doesn't have to be high volume, but you'll find that it's a little bit better than um, what ends up happening quite often is you do the same thing kind of over and over again, because it's your default mode. Um, but if you do like the different buckets you're pulling from, it'll, it'll engage your audience a little bit more. Encourage you not to repost from other organizations. Um, unless you've got like a, an owner that perhaps, you know, necessitates that. Um, instead, do fewer posts that's all original content from your station. Um, better for the algorithm, but also better for your audience. Um, definitely tag people if at all possible. I will tell you that when we tag the sheriff or the, the board of commissioners um, or for the county or uh, the, the board of or the school district on a post, if we're doing some storytelling about them, they are much more likely to then share it inside of their network. Um, tagging allows you to engage so much more, which is great. And then a big fan of promoting guests and takeovers. Um, anytime you've got anyone in the community who would be seen as kind of like an influencer or somebody who everyone knows and loves, you know, giving um, some space over to them on social media, whether it's just taking a quick video or having them um, communicate with your audience, that can be a really useful and engaging tool. Um, last but not least, always ask questions of the audience. Um, if you can, um, you know, in that, in that conversation piece, what do they want to know more about? What do they want to see and hear? What, uh, what's the music that they want played? What are the stories that they want covered? Um, that can be an incredibly uh, strong engagement tool for social. And then definitely recommend reporters or talent going live um, or videoing themselves when they can and then doing behind the scenes content. I will say across all social media products and platforms, behind the scenes content is the winner, particularly video. Um, and it's not just the weather person at the green screen. I mean, I think that's, people like to see that too, but it's in your studio, in your station. What does it look like to do what you do? Because a lot of people just don't know what we do um, still anymore. A uh, quick note on revenue. Um, just want to be honest here and say that social media platforms really are destabilizing, right? We can't really make money off of them. I have seen people do some digital advertising on social um, and, 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 you know, get some revenue out of it. But in general, when we post our content to social media, they gain the revenue, not us. Um, and so I think that's one reason to be kind of judicious about how we use social. Um, we don't necessarily want to put everything that we have put in the broadcast that week on social media. Um, we want to drive them to our actual organic, the products that we've created that we can monetize um, and just use social as a way for conversation and connection um, instead. Because I think ultimately what we're doing is just giving content away for free. And we do have to be careful about the kind of the revenue ROI on that. 
Um, so that's my big revenue takeaway. You want to use social media to um, get people familiar with who you are, what you're doing, and to have conversations with you. Not so that they will necessarily click through, but so that they will develop a goodwill, a brand, um, a relationship with you and your station, and then they will go organically to your revenue building products. So just to be brutally honest, it's a long game. Um, it's, it's really about being visible, being part of their lives, um, and then going, oh, you know, I wonder, like, I wonder if I'll just listen real quick, or I wonder if I'll just go to their website real quick, or I wonder if I'll, and you will see it happen, but it, it's a little bit of a longer road at building that relationship. Um, quick, couple quick thoughts on vertical video, and then I'll take some questions. So, um, vertical video is obviously um, a trend, mostly because when we use mobile devices, we don't typically hold them like this, right? I mean, we're going to actually hold them vertically. And so the advent of vertical video comes from a couple very specific social media platforms, um, Instagram Reels, which is the video part of Instagram, um, as well as Instagram Stories, Snapchat, TikTok, and to some degree, YouTube Shorts, although that hasn't really taken off quite yet. Those are all built for vertical style video. Now, for those of you in the TV industry, vertical video feels like sacrilege, right? I mean, I still have some of my colleagues are like, are you kidding me? Like, really? Um, we keep, we're trying to get people to turn their phones this way anyway. Um, but there are times to do it. And, and here's what I will say about vertical video, because I don't love it from a, a, a conceptual standpoint always. The reason we do it is partially because people are holding their phones like this, right? And so that, and they're not going to probably tip that thing. Um, but the other reason is vertical video is so much more personal. It's authentic. It's more raw. It's more of me like now talking to you and having a conversation and thinking through things together. When you go horizontal, for whatever reason, the culture of it is produced and kind of stayed and formal. But vertical video has a connectedness that people are really looking for right now. So I'm going to show you a couple very quick examples of different ways that you can implement vertical video. So this is obviously um, a CNN, so um, a little bit above my pay grade. But you can see how they take what could have been a polished package and make it a vertical video walkthrough. Getting another taste of the Aloha spirit and organization. Uh, this is one of the many hubs that have been set up around Lahaina. People are sort of managing all the donations best they can. Uh, clothes and food, water. They're always in need of ice, ice and fuel are the big needs uh, but this is so you can kind of see the idea that it feels authentic it feels like you're with you're hanging out with bill you know walking around this place and seeing it through his eyes and with him that is what vertical video does well we're also seeing a lot of people use graphics behind them or using just a stand-up version of vertical video to talk about uh important news events so this is jessica yellen and she, this is what she does. And you can see even from the likes here, right? We've got over 9,000 people engaging with this vertical video. That's, that's really good. Now, just to take it to maybe something a little bit more personal to you all, I loved this vertical video on TikTok from a radio station personality.
I love this kind of storytelling. Oh, is it not playing? Yeah, Amanda, I, I didn't hear it. Oh, no. You didn't either. We'll cry. And, and um, we didn't hear the one before either. Oh, so I have no idea why you wouldn't, because I have the audio sharing on. Um, I can share this slide deck, Mackenzie, if you want to. Um, it has the links to it. Um, so you can watch it. So were you seeing it but not hearing it? You weren't seeing it either. I saw and heard the first one, but the last two I wasn't able to see. They just didn't play on my end personally. Okay. Okay. Um, does this change it? And you're wondering Wait. why? Well, I'm going to explain that to you in this video. Yeah. The first thing you need to know, the average listener only tunes in for 15 minutes. I want you to imagine these as stacks of CDs with individual songs on each and every one of them. Category A is the most popular music. Category B is up and coming. Category C is brand new music. And then this larger stack of O's is our old recurrent music that is still stuff that's loved that we keep in there. And then this is how it gets laid out. We have A, B, C, O, and commercials, which comes out to about 15 minutes. Here's the thing. Once this song is done, we take it and we put it on the bottom of the so you saw that one, right? Okay, good. So, I mean, that was that was a really good example for me of, um, let me just see if I can, I think I've got it now. I think I've got the, the way the, the organic works of somebody in a radio station booth talking about why you do hear the same songs, right? And how they pick that and how they think about everyone listens for about 15 minutes. This is the kind of thing that can build a conversation, it can build a brand, um, and it really engages you with your audience that hopefully then they do come and they're like, oh, I'm gonna listen for 15 minutes and see if I can see how this works, right? Here's another example, and I'll hopefully get the sharing right, um, of an older trend on TikTok uh, that a TV station did um, that was uh, just, again, kind of a behind the scenes. <laughs> So you can see through these types of examples, first of all, it can be a little bit fun. It can be engaging. It can allow you to connect with your audience. Um, and I think the idea of vertical video, it feels again, so for somebody who was trained with, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning reporters and like, this is the way you do it and we keep it. I think engaging younger audiences really is based on the premises. We need to let them know who we are and that we do have a good time sometimes at our stations. And we need to communicate that as much as we're communicating the information that we're telling them um, in order to, to better build that brand. Um, so one last thing that I want to show you um, is this, uh, it's actually a former student of mine. She does a Snapchat show called Good Luck Los Angeles, where she does deep dives, vertical video, in a lot of reporting. Potholes, encampments, less than stellar public transit. Guess what they all have in common? They are unfortunately expensive as hell to fix. Good news, or bad news, is that the LA City Council is about to vote on a $12.8 billion budget for next year. And the bad news, or good news, is that that's actually $300 million less than what we've been working with for this year. B -b -b budget goods. So here's your no BS guide on how that's going to affect your life as an angel. I'm releasing my budget for the coming fiscal year. How this all works is that the mayor, that's Miss KB, proposes a budget. After the proposal, there's a bunch of hearings where people go and plead their cases for why that budget should be amended. Good morning, Budget, Finance, and Innovation Committee. That phase can be brutal, and it just finished up this past Wednesday. After that, the city council votes to approve the budget by the end of May, and then boom, it goes into effect July 1st. Based on past histories, like 99% of what the mayor initially proposes will be approved. So what's on the table right now? Start off a 10% cut to the street lighting budget, which if approved, the dude in charge. So one of the things that I think is kind of crucial about this idea, um, and this is obviously targeting a, a young audience, okay? So um, uh, the idea is that she's trying to take a fairly complex thing like the Los Angeles city budget and communicate it to younger people in a way that they're gonna get um, and they're gonna be able to talk about. And again, that comes through this vertical video idea of her talking, explaining, showing some B-roll and some other things that are going on. Um, 
Kat does an amazing job of doing in-depth investigative reporting through vertical video. Uh, I highly recommend looking her up on Snapchat um, to, to see how that works. Couple big thoughts about vertical video. Number one, if you do it, it's gotta be a story. It connects to the audience through someone facing the camera, talking directly to you. And you can use B-roll and other right visuals, absolutely. But it's about someone delivering information in a really um, kind of specific and engaging way. Um, you can kind of see what works and what doesn't if you if you play around with some of the vertical video. Um, but one of the things I want to make sure to tell you before we open it up for questions is that um, I, I've given you a lot of information in a very short a period of time, but I don't want to just be like, hey, figure this out. Um, we actually have two programs here at the University of Georgia that I run. Um, the GAB Innovation Fellows and Digital Natives, and um, they're kind of explained below, where I will send a student into your room or into your station, and we will help you with all of these things. Um, what's amazing is our students know how to do this, um, and they know how to do it well and organically in a way that engages audiences. And so if it feels overwhelming or a lot to think about, that is absolutely where the University of Georgia wants to come in. These programs are free to stations. Um, they're, they're funded by the GAB and some donors, um, and it allows us to go, hey, you want to build um, an Instagram account that connects to younger audiences and uses vertical video? Let us help you do that. Um, and so to me, that's the exciting part is we don't want to just say, hey, this is best practice, but we want to help you actually be able to do this at your station. Okay, so time for questions. What questions, comments, thoughts? can I help you with? Do we have any? Hey, Dr. Brian. This is... Oh, go ahead. You can, you go ahead. You... Oh, okay. Hey, Dr. Brian, it's Jody, your colleague. Um, Hi, one Jody. of the things that I've heard you talk, hey, one of the things that, I, this is wonderful. One of the things that I've heard you talk about um, that I don't think was mentioned here, at least I didn't hear it, is everything that you've brought up does something else that you've explained to me in the past about, you know, when you do behind the scenes, how it helps um, combat misinformation and disinformation by enhancing transparency, credibility. Can you talk about that just a minute, about the importance of everything you're talking about to greater goals and challenges that we face? Yeah, so one of the programs we have at the University of Georgia is called the Certificate of News Literacy. And so I teach the capstone of that as well sometimes. One of the obviously struggles that we're dealing with as an industry right now in broadcasting and, and otherwise is trust. Obviously, our audience is not where we want them to be size wise. A part of that is because of trust and transparency and accountability. Um, and the fact that most people, again, just don't know who we are and what we're doing and why, like they did, say, even a couple decades ago. I think the thing about using social for conversation and for connection and the idea of what Dodie just talked about with behind the scenes content. It accomplishes like three goals concurrently. Um, obviously, it, it makes you more engaged and, and personal and, and builds those connections. It builds your brand and makes you more visible as you're a member of the community who's providing some connectedness. But it also shows people who we are and why we're here, um, that we're real people, that we are not AI, that we are not um, driven by profit, um, that we are serving local communities, doing the good work every day of informing, alerting, and entertaining um, about what they need to know in order to make decisions about their community. And when you do behind the scenes content, it is a transparency, accountability um, tool so that they know what the process looks like. You know, we don't just throw things up on air. We don't just, you know, play things randomly. Um, what our goals are, what's behind those goals. And I think that kind of forward facing education is a little bit weird for those of us that come from a media industry that didn't have to do that in the past. But I think we do have to do it now. And I think we owe it to our audiences to say, this is who we are. This is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And we're here to serve you. Um, and and I, I think the the vertical video behind the scenes stuff really accomplishes that goal beautifully without being quite so direct in how it's articulated. Thanks, Jody. Uh, 
other questions or thoughts or comments? Yeah, kind of in the same vein, like, do we have any idea why people are not clicking on links as much in social posts? Is that, I've seen that personally happen a lot to where a lot of our more yeah. organic posting um, yeah. is not getting as many link clicks as it used to. Um, I'm wondering if that's just like maybe more of a trust issue with like a lot of scam accounts being super prevalent lately mm -hmm. and misinformation, or if it's just like, kind of the, just the evolution of users on social media? I don't know, what do you think? So, I mean, this is this is the million dollar question. I love, um, I love this question. I think, so yeah, to go back to even what we just talked about with Dodie, um, it, I don't know about you, but I get a text from Amazon every other day telling me I've got a package somewhere and I should clink this link, or clink, click, ooh, click this link. Um, it, it is incredibly problematic in a society where disinformation and scams are even more prevalent, that people don't want to click stuff. That's really true. Um, so I think that is a huge part of what we're talking about here. Um, now, most people, I don't think when they're on Facebook, they think if you know they click the link to a TV station, they're going to go to a bad place necessarily. Um, but I think that there's that inherentness of it. Um, I think part two of it would be the fact that a lot of our websites, which is where they're clicking through, are not well done or designed. And again, I would love to sit and talk with you about this. We have a lot going on. There's a lot of pop-up ads. There's a lot of um, information. There's a huge nav bar with like 12 different options. And people are just overwhelmed when they get to those spaces about what to do, see, or look at next. And so they just don't go. Um, so I think a lot of in the news industry and in the entertainment broadcasting industry, we need to think about really streamlining our websites to make them more user friendly for our audiences. And I think if we started doing that, click through rates, I don't know if they would necessarily hugely improve, but I think it would help that experience if they did go through. I think the other piece of this is that our media ecosystem is so fragmented, right? We're all on so many different products and platforms. Moving between them feels like a hassle. Things have to load. You've got, right, where am I going? It's opening in a new window. Um, a lot of people have the tech, but they're not necessarily savvy about the tech. And I think it's so much easier just to stay on the product or platform that you're on and then keep scrolling versus bouncing off and then how do I get back and where does it happen? So again, I think that's why we don't necessarily try to refer people off um, because it's just not functionally something they're going to want to do. Um, they wanna get the information they need on the platform that they're on. And so what we talk a lot about with our students at Grady is don't tease. Like don't say, you can learn more if blank, just if they need to know something, tell them the thing they need to know on the product or platform that they are on. And then if they trust you, they will keep finding your information. They will go to your organic products. It's like building a relationship and like, you know, saying next date we'll kiss, you know? <laughs> like, I mean, it's just, it's, we need to make sure that we're delivering on the promises that we give up front. So fabulous question. Yeah, thank you. Great answer. Any other questions or thoughts for today? I have a question um, piggybacking on the link thing. Is, yes. Would you say it would be the same for a QR code as well? You know, QR codes are such a weird space right now, Grace. So um, I love this question too. Um, it, we, I would say there's a certain percentage of the population that has no idea what to do with a QR code. Like, right? I mean, it just none at all. Like, it's just a weird black blobby thing. And they have, and, and so they're really put off by that. Um, I think certain people are interested in QR codes, but by the time you upload, you get the camera open, you hold it over, and then you try to go to the link, the interface on them are, is not particularly strong. So you end up getting a lot of misfires and people not actually getting to the place that you want them to get. So between kind of ignorance and a little bit of a UX, like user bad experience, I have found QR codes in general to not be effective. Now we have used them. We've used them with um, the Oglethorpe Echo, who, which is one of my news organizations from time to time, but we do not get high response rates. Um, I think because of those two factors. The question, of course, is how do we get people to the place where we are, right? And I mean, and that's, and, and that is important. 
Um, I really think that one of the biggest futures that we have, email newsletters um, are still doing exceptionally well. Um, and there's a lot of growth, I think, that we might see in SMS, like direct texting, if people want to sign up for alerts from your radio or TV station about events going on in the area um, and things like that. But products where we deliver it straight to you versus you having to go out and find it are the ones that are doing better. So if it shows up in my podcast feed or it shows up in my email inbox or it shows up on my phone naturally, I'm much more likely to engage in it. Um, and QR codes, unfortunately, are that extra hump, you know, that people have to, to navigate through. I wouldn't say never use them, but I just think that there's kind of a very narrow audience. OK, thank you. Absolutely. Well, fantastic questions today. Um, just once again, want to kind of um, remind you about the digital strategy guide. This is something I built as a labor of love. It's got um, it's got tons of topics, um, and uh, I was going to see if I can pop over and show you real quick. Um, so anything from goal setting to how to set a visual design and brand to how to make good video products, how to look at analytics. Um, this is something that I built in order to serve stations specifically for digital strategy needs. And it's free to GAB members. So if you um, email this link on the Digital Strategy Guide website, um, they will email you a copy. And um, I would also love to individually talk to any stations and think through it and or um, provide students to kind of help you think through these things. Um, the students absolutely adore coming to your stations and helping think about digital strategy with you. Um, unless there's anything else, I just wanna thank you for your time today. It was nice to have a nice room full of boxes and letters, but I know you have faces behind those boxes and letters. Um, and um, I just really wanna to continue to work with, with all of you and your stations to help you um, think about how best to reach your audiences. So I appreciate your time. <laughs>